Welcome. Welcome back to The Black Table. My name is Greg Carr, your host here on the Black Star Network. Uh, each week, we take a little bit of a deeper dive. Uh, we try to build the momentum of memory, try to gain perspective, try to sketch a bit of a roadmap uh, so that we can access more information, uh, try to turn down the noise and have a broader conversation and dialogue with folk that we need to hear from to help us make sense of the times we live in. And this week, uh, we are honored to be joined by another giant. Uh, this is a brother who is a founder of the field and discipline of Black Studies. He's a scholar, he's an activist, he's a chronicler. And he's a chronicler of particularly Black politics in the broader field of political science. Uh, he is the author of uh, 19 books, over 100 academic articles, um, he is the editor of a series, uh, the most, um, the best known really series in many ways in the field of African-American studies for the State University of New York Press. And he has recently completed an intellectual autobiography, uh, not only a record of his life to date, but a record of the times in which he's lived. Uh, so we are honored to be joined today by none other than Dr. Robert C. Smith, who is the author of this book right here, From the Bayou to the Bay, the Autobiography of a Black Liberation Scholar. Prof, it's good to have you, brother. How you doing, yeah. man? I'm doing very well, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Black Table. Um, I want to jump right in. Um, you, you dedicate the book to Omar X, who we'll meet in a moment, I think around, I think chapter two, when you head out to the West Coast, your sister's mm -hmm. going out here and go to school. Uh, Harry Scoville, Ron Walters, of course, the man you refer to as the most important uh, black scholar activist of the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. John, John Howard, we're going to talk about that when he recruits you away from the Negro College, which you've returned to for the second time <laughs> <laughs> to come out there to the SUNY purchase. Uh, the great Mac Jones, uh, who you coaxed into finally publishing his essays in, in your in the imprint that you edit for SUNY Press and Haynes yeah. Walton Jr. Uh, the man, yeah. you know, now, now unlike them, and of course you've done a couple of books on, on Ron Walters, you have taken a moment and you you open your, your autobiography by saying that you were just gonna sit and kind of do nothing, but you've taken this moment to do something that too many of our warriors have not been able to do. And that is to actually sit and give a recounting not only of their life to date, but the but their times. You, what's the importance of this book? Why why should particularly young people looking for roadmaps pick up from the Bayou to the Bay? Well, every generation builds on the previous generations, and that's that's kind of a, a kind of first purpose, a first reason. But the nineteen sixties was. Uh, most a most consequential generation in American history. I, I came of age in the 1960s politically, and that was the best generation for Black people in the history of this country. But it, it wasn't World War II? Probably. World War II. Oh, oh my God. Oh, um, uh, <laughs> Tom, Tom Brokaw, the greatest generation, yeah. I think the 1960s generation was the greatest generation. I think mm -hmm. that generation made a contribution to making America a better place than any other generation prior, or since for that matter. Mm -hmm. So I thought telling the story of my coming of age in that time period and all the things that were going on that I had a chance to engage both personally and uh, indirectly was a useful way to lay a kind of groundwork for where we came from and how far we have to go. We had great aspirations in the 1960s that we were going to bring about really fundamental revolutionary changes in the country. We, of course, did not. We brought about substantive changes in such a way that the African people were put on a much firmer ground in terms of psychological and political power. And so I wanted to tell how I came to that, because I certainly didn't start out that way, coming from rural Louisiana. I was a, I was a Booker T. Washington person when I left rural Louisiana. I, I was- When you left, but 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 you got that. But before we, before we get to you leaving Louisiana, help us, could you give us a hint of the world of Benton, Louisiana? Because the, the portrait you paint in the book 
while it may not have been a politically active, you know, to your consciousness growing up, it certainly poured a foundation in you where you didn't think white people were inferior or, or any of that. I mean, talk, could you talk to us a little bit about your mother, Blanche, and, and your community? Yeah, there? my mother was, uh, she was a very powerful woman. She was the strongest woman I've ever known. And she, she raised me a single mother. Uh, I knew my father. I know well, there's some controversy about who was my father, as a matter of fact. But the not man, exactly. I, you're not alone, brother. We, you know, not, that's a common story in the black community. Right. <laughs> but uh, she gave me, uh, she gave me the material foundation. She was not her. When I would do well in school or when I would make a speech, she would not compliment me. She just assumed that that was the way things ought to be. Mm -hmm. Ben was a town of about a thousand people, uh, half black, half white, thoroughly segregated. But as I say in the book, that segregation did not bother us at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. Civil rights movement was taking place in Shreveport, which is about 14 miles away. My sister was engaged in the movement. My nephew, who was the same age as I was engaged in the movement. But I was completely disengaged. And as I thought about why, why, I thought that it was because of the community, that we had a black community sitting around church and school that gave us a sense of ourselves. And so we we didn't have, as I said, we didn't have, we didn't have any, what I came to know later of a phenomenon called a sense of internal inferiorization. Mm -hmm. None of us had that. We We thought that we didn't, look down on our hair or color or anything of that sort. And I don't know why, how, how we escaped that, except to say that we had a community of church and school that I think build a sense of blackness before blackness was uh, what we were called or, or before that term was used. Yeah, but again, that's, that's what I was thinking, Doc, Doc as, you were, as you were writing, I was stunned to hear and to read rather, you say that even in your in, in your school, and help me pronounce it, is it Orion or Irion? C H Iron. Iron, uh, of course. Yeah. Iron. I should have said oh, C H Iron. Right. I mean, heavily as an adult and as a scholar looking back, I suppose you, you kind of narrate it perhaps as being policed from without by these white folks, because you didn't learn black history. You said only two approved Negroes was Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. But That's still, right. but culturally, you still got that black pride. That's fascinating. Yeah, and I again, I thinking back on it, I can't, I don't really understand it. it. It should not have been that way. In most, I don't know whether in most cases it was not that way or not. But in our case, we had the school. It was our school. The, the, the white overlords would come and make sure the teachers didn't go too far. I remember one of the speeches I gave at, at, at high in high school. I mentioned that. Uh, something about uh, Booker T. Washington liberating his people or something like that. <laughs> uh, and, yes, sir. And uh, the teachers made me take it out because they thought that might have been a little inflammatory. So Black teachers. Black teachers. Many so, of them who would lose their jobs after the mergers. Yes, yes. My goodness. And I, we would have... We, I would have strongly opposed, I think all of us would have strongly opposed the integration of the schools. And the schools were integrated, I, I graduated in 65. Mm -hmm. The schools were integrated in 69. And the black school was destroyed. That part of the black community was destroyed. And we would have no more supported integrating the schools than we would have supported integrating the church because those were the foundations of, of, of the community. We have, and, uh, I think- No, I go think, ahead, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, bro. go right ahead. No, I think the loss of that, the loss of that black control space uh, even now has an effect on the black community because our children today are taught in so-called integrated environments. But in fact, the environments are controlled by white people and there's no opportunity for black people to develop the kind of community we developed in our school and urban and rural schools today. It's it's white domination without any kind of black capacity to have a community because it's so-called integrated. I guess that was probably not, not doable. It was probably not doable to maintain well, it, uh, uh, a separate 
it probably is not doable to do with high schools and elementary schools hmm. what we were able to do with historically black colleges. We were able to integrate the universities in this Louisiana, LSU, and all the rest of them, but nevertheless maintain Southern and Grambling as distinctive black places. I don't think that Hal Cruz suggested that should have been. I, I, was, I was going to mention that you you yeah. actually uh, you served. Uh, well, you met Cruz right when you were at Prairie View. I think Mac Jones had recruited you out there. You spent yeah, there. Matt out Cruz, there. a wonderful experience at Prairie View to meet Hal Cruz. Spent t- two three days talking with him. That's what you said, yeah. and yeah, it even yeah. offered to uh, to help him do what you've done. But yeah, she got away from you. <laughs> and uh, I wish you have had the opportunity to do it, but the yeah. distance, you know, and Auburn in San Francisco made it eventually not doable. But but, uh, but it's interesting because you, of course, who have devoted now over fifty years to really clear-eyed. And of that generation, you, Mac Jones, Haynes Walton, so many others, to being very clear in having research and data informed analysis. Um, and we know the schools are more segregated now than they were even in that period, unfortunately. Right. Um, uh, in fact, uh, there's a sister, uh, Leslie Fenwick, uh, who was the former dean of the School of Education at Howard. She's just written a book called Jim Crow's Pink Slip, where she talks about what happened to that black teaching force. But um, that you know, you didn't stay in Louisiana. You 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 went out to, instead of going to Grambling, instead of going to Southern, and you say, well, if they had offered scholarships, maybe I'd have gone. Mm-hmm. You end up being pulled to the West Coast. Now, what what, what was the thinking behind that? I mean, because well, you, you could have stayed there and gone to school, but you... you... Well, the I had two, what, two sisters in Los Angeles uh-huh. who had migrated. And you're the youngest of how many? I'm the youngest of 14. 14. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And two sisters and a brother were there and they said, come to California because the education is free. And that was, I guess, the main motivation. If I, as I said in the book, if I got a scholarship, traditionally, I graduated second in the class of, in the class of 35 and traditionally mm-hmm. the first and second place graduates got scholarships to Grambling and the Southern. If I'd received the scholarship, I might have stayed in, in, in Louisiana and attended Southern, but I didn't, and uh, I didn't have any money. So my sister said, come to live with me. Of course, that's free of charge. And after one year of residence, you can become, you can get free tuition to attend universities in California. Hmm. So that was that was what happened. Let's, uh, let's, let's pause here for a moment and, uh, when we return from the break, we are going to um, we're going to follow you. We're going to follow Professor Smith into what he refers to in his autobiography as uh, the awakening. Mm-hmm. When we pick up at past the break. We're going to um, continue with Professor Robert C. Smith, um, author of From the Bayou to the Bay, the autobiography of a Black liberation scholar, and continue to trace the history of the journey of Black folk in the United States and, and beyond. The second half of the 20th century, the first two decades of the 21st. Back in a moment at the Black Tape. Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table. I'm Greg Carr. Um, I'm to be in conversation today with Professor Robert C. Smith. And we are now, uh, Prof, going to pick up. You're you're on the West Coast. 
Mm -hmm. um, and you hit a heavily segregated Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and it sounds like you um, I was thinking about Clark Kerr, the architect, if uh, memory serves me correctly, of that, of that three tiered California mm -hmm. university system. And you hit every tier. Huh? Yes. So, <laughs> tell me about that. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Well, uh, I first attended uh, the three tiers as the junior college, about a, you know, hundred, more than 100 junior colleges across the state, in which you all you needed is a high school uh, diploma to enter. So I attended Los Angeles City College uh, initially for virtually nothing, just small fees you had to pay. And then uh, I spent two years there, earned an Associate of Arts degree, and then I transferred to the second tier of the system, which was the California State University at Los Angeles. And that's a four year. Well, actually, the state, the state universities offer, can offer a master's degree, but it's basically a four year training institution. And I spent, what, two years, a year and a half, a year and a half there, I guess. And then I transferred to the University of California, Berkeley, where I earned the undergraduate degree. And then I earned a master's at UCLA before I moved on to Howard to get the PhD. So all of this was free without just pay nominal uh, student fees, no tuition. And it was a remarkable opportunity to get an education without debt. I mean, students today have enormous debt. And I graduated from college without any debt. I got uh, student loans, but I got the student loans largely to to buy cars and not to pay. Yeah, because you uh, y'all killed the car driving out there. <laughs> right. <Sure. laughs> driving, up, driving up to Berkeley, yeah, my old Falcon was killed, and <laughs> I got a student loan, and I got a 1967 green Mustang. Oh, and have mercy! Well, you know, that's so funny. Like, uh, the generosity of those student loans. Those Ronald student Reagan loans. Was came to office committed to ending free tuition in the university system. So oh. uh, shortly after he took office, they began to gradually increase tuition, tuition, tuition. So now the University of California is almost expensive as most private institutions. And that's unbelievable. That, of course, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, of course, Joe Biden today talks about free tuition for junior colleges, but there's no reason why this country could not provide free. There's no reason why the country as a whole could not do what California did from the 50s and the 60s. Well, it was a conservative backlash against against education, really. Well, well that's what I was going to say. One of the books that uh, that you published, uh, in fact, I want to say, was this 2010? You did the book on conservatism and racism being essentially the same thing? I think it was... 20, I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah, but, but, but I know yeah. I know you say in the book that of all the books, and of course, one of the major books that, one of the many books you've done that's had a great impact on me and so many in my generation is, is your book, We Have No Leaders. And right. while you hold that book up, you also say that that conservatism and racism are the same thesis. You know, I th help me. I think you say in the book that you consider that to be perhaps one of your greatest accomplishments in terms of that that thesis because it seems like yes, you're I, 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 I think my most certainly my most my most influential book was we have no leaders yeah. and uh I, I it's i think it's it makes an important contribution but conservatism and racism and why in america they are the same i would say is a book that i probably have the most uh, admiration for, I suppose, because it lays out a thesis that's very controversial. Even now it's controversial. Last year, I guess it was at Georgetown, their diversity center, their multiculturalism center, put that book on its reading list as a, for its students to read books about racism in America. And there was a huge controversy. The conservative students protested and eventually they had to take the book off the reading list. Really? Yeah, that was at Georgetown University. And they just, Georgetown Law just had a big contretemps with two of their professors. It seemed like if any place needs to read that book, it would be Georgetown. <laughs> they, they had that kind of pushback. But the students, the conservative students on campus said, he's calling me a racist. He wow. said all conservatives are racist. I was not, I, that was not their argument. My argument was that if you, anyone embraces 
in a strict ideological sense, the tenets of conservatism in America, mm -hmm. that will have the same effect on black people as if they're racist. Ronald Reagan was, as far as you can tell, probably not a racist, mm -hmm. but he was a doctrinaire conservative. Mm -hmm. led him to oppose every civil rights bill, whether it was in California or the United States, because he said the federal government did not have the authority to require Alabama to treat black people equally. So and we, get, we see the same thing today. Uh, conservative ideology, a rigid adherence to it inevitably leads in the United States. This is historically the case, and it's the case today. The effect of that is racism. And oh. The, the very title of the book elicited anger, as you might expect, from conservative, conservatives who thought that was a slur. Now, now, one thing people can't do, no one can do, and, and to, including this, your, your personal journey, is accuse you of allowing ideology uh, to trump hard, cold research. In fact, you say near the end of the book that you've, you've spent your... Uh, your career to date, documenting the critical ideological material and structural constraints that confine blacks as a collectivity to subordinate position in America. And so while they might not like what you say, and in fact, you, you talk some about uh, African-American attitudes towards immigration and how the data might uh, lead people to findings that might be controversial. But, but I, mean, I want to think about so So Reagan is now the governor of California. And you're there at a point when education has opened up in many ways. And you talk about your awakening at all of those levels. In fact, one of the brothers you dedicate the book to. But I mean, I, I, quite frankly, those everyone reading, the people you engage from Angela Davis to the work of Malcolm X and Mary Baraka, so many others. And then, you know, coming uh, into the whole Us Panther conflict and, and being right. there in the whole. I mean, it seems like it's a really stunning array. And by the time you get to Berkeley, of course, a man who is who we've talked to at the black table, um, who will ultimately be part of recruiting you to Howard to uh, to go to school and eventually to work. Andrew Billingsley. Yes. Berkeley. I mean, could you help us understand? Give us a glimpse of what the mill you was at that moment, because, you know, the, the 60s. Let me, let me say, at Los Angeles City College, I was unengaged politically. Hmm. Uh, didn't take part in any kind of campus activities. And I transferred to Cal State L.A. And there you had a large mass of black people. There were very few at Los Angeles City College, but Cal State LA, you had a large number of black students, and they already had a well-established black student union. Huh. And so that brought me into the struggle. <laughs> Coming in from unengaged, Booker T. Washington mindset, <laughs> then come to Cal State LA, and I meet this brother, Omar X, and he turns me on to the, to the struggle. He introduced, he introduced me first to Malcolm X. I had this impression of Malcolm that he was, you know, the news media's image of Malcolm. Of course. Ireland and anti-white and. Of course. I was particularly bothered by his remarks about the assassination of President Kennedy and the chickens coming home to roost. And Omar mm -hmm. said, man, forget about that. First, just go read the book. You, you know what's fascinating about this? Alice Wyndham, one of the things uh, who just made transition in St. Louis, who, of course, was living in Ghana with Maya Angelou, that was her roommate. She says the same thing about Shirley Graham Du Bois. She said when Malcolm came to Ghana, he went to meet Nkrumah. They went to Shirley Graham Du Bois to help her, ask her if she'd make the introduction. And she said, well, based on these reports, I don't know if I like Malcolm. She said once they introduced her to Malcolm, she sat with him. She went straight to Nkrumah and said, you got to talk to this guy. So, I mean, so 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 when he introduced you to Malcolm, it kind of opened you up. Huh? It opened me up and I read the autobiography and then he had tapes of Malcolm's speeches. And huh. that was within, I don't know, six months of his transformation because the truth of Malcolm's teachings were, well, were obvious. I just did not know those teachings. But once I learned them, that was that was that was the key to my opening my eyes. Uh, so Omar, I, I dedicate the book to Omar because without him, I don't know whether, I, I, I think I probably would have made that journey, but it probably would have been slower and less active without without his engagement. He was a student at Cal State LA. We worked together at the post office on the loading dock. And so we were constantly talking politics and politics. And he was the chair of the Black Studies Committee 
at Cal State LA, and he appointed me to that committee, which is how I began my engagement with uh, with the Black Studies. So you're at the founding of Black Studies, really. I mean, you yes. yeah, you write about that. I mean, the memos you wrote, the op eds, and the newspapers. Yes. But then you leave the BSU. I mean, you talk about even that ideological ferment at the time. Yeah, man, this was this was Southern California. <laughs> Ron Karinga's organization, us, and the Black Panther Party were struggling for ideological primacy in the LA Black radical community whether you were for the revolutionary nationalism of the Panthers or the cultural nationalism of the organization US. And one of the things they struggled over hmm. was influence over the new black studies programs that were emerging, which, which, which group was gonna have the most influence over those programs, including getting resources from those programs. And so shortly after I completed the proposal, cool, co-authored the proposal for the Black Studies Department and it was accepted. There was an election and the US faction, Ron, Kring Ron Karinga's faction, won the election over the Black Panther faction, which I was identified with. And that meant uh, that my role in Black Studies and the Black Student Union would likely come to an end. And at the same time, and I'm not sure how this came about, we learned that Berkeley was trying to begin to recruit uh, black students. Berkeley at that time probably had no more than 50 black students on campus. Wow. Uh, and so they began an active effort to recruit black students. And I was a part of this first affirmative action recruitment class in 1969. So that was kind of uh, advanta advantageous. I was in a difficult position at Cal State Los Angeles. And so the opportunity to go to Berkeley got me out of that difficult situation and put me at the center of radicalism in, the, in, in, mm. in California. The center of black radicalism and white radicalism was centered around the Oakland Bay Area, Black Panthers, the student movement, the anti-war movement. So that was a good opportunity to, to make that transfer. Mm -hmm. But it was, again, it was somewhat by happenstance. I had no intention of the minds <laughs> to attend Berkeley. But when the opportunity came, I was in this kind of stressful situation at Cal State LA. Uh, LA. So I said, let's go. So let's we go. drove up the coast and three of us <laughs> and, uh, so, in that phase of the struggle. So then when we, we want to take another break, and when we come back, we're going to uh, follow you. We're going to follow Professor Smith uh, as a graduate student at Berkeley and then UCLA. And then uh, coming, he comes all the way back east to the Northeast, to New York. And we're going to see the shaping of this Black Liberation Scholar as he begins to wed that hardcore empirical research methodology to the question of the liberation of Black folk. Back at the Black table in a minute. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. We're back at the Black Table with Professor Robert C. Smith, author of the uh, new autobiography, From the Bayou to the Bay, the autobiography of a Black liberation scholar, one of the towering figures in the history and continuing intellectual work of Black studies. Prof, when we left, you had uh, entered Berkeley and you said the minuscule number of Black folk, uh, Andrew Billingsley, who's still hailing Hardy and swinging with both fists in his mid nineties, uh, yeah. <laughs> had just had just been appointed to to try to work out a black studies program. You work through that, and and you also yeah. talk about the anti Cambodia dimension of the anti war movement, and you uh, you figured out the the simple way to avoid 
having to be pulled up in the draft. I, I wish yeah. they had sent that memo out at the time. <laughs> but then you end up also um, going to UCLA for your masters, and then you end up on the East Coast. Help us understand. I mean, because at this moment, it seems like you wed this commitment to the life of the mind to the liberation of black people. And that's a struggle that so many students are trying to do today. And it seems like some of us have lost our way. Help us understand why well, that, was, that was. That was the chaos. That was the black studies experience. Black mm -hmm. studies said, we can use knowledge. We professors and students can use knowledge to contribute to the liberation of black people. Mm -hmm. That one of the bases of power in any society is knowledge. And so we saw that the, we saw the uh, black studies as a kind of intellectual base for the black liberation movement. I should go back and I should go back. I mentioned Malcolm. Yes. But I particularly because I, as I've told you time and time again, you remind me so much of him. <laughs> and that's Stokely Carmichael. So oh, please. yeah. Y'all were at the Free Huey rally. I could not believe that, man. You were literally there that day when stuff. And then, of course, he ends up haunting your office at Howard. You in the basement of, of Douglas Hall. Yeah. <laughs> he's tough, he's tough, about he's tough, not ready for revolution, ready for revolution. <laughs> but, but I so, he did. Malcolm did have a huge influence through the autobiography, through his yes. tapes. Yes. And then Stokely Alive in the Black Power Movement. Those two things made me, or gave me my commitment to the struggle. Huh. And so when I arrived at Berkeley, the struggle was ongoing. I mean, they had fought a huge battle on the campus to establish Black Studies. I was part of the first Black Studies class, took three classes from Don Davis. Don Davis uh, taught for a long time at Berkeley. I mean, at Howard. At Howard, you're a colleague. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was my first mentor. He grounded me and historical Edward Wilmot Blyden, all the way up through the Pan Black Panther Party, which was kind of our case study. So that was part of it. And then there was the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. uh, Gordon Bruno, at, back at LACC, had taught me about the imperialist nature of US foreign policy. And so by the time I got to Berkeley, I was thoroughly committed. And sometimes we almost have to balance that. I was almost in some sense as committed to assisting the Vietnamese people in their liberation as in fighting the struggle here. I participated in the numerous anti-war demonstrations because I saw the Vietnam War as, as just an effort of the United States to continue French colonialism in Vietnam. Well, so those were my passions at the time, Black studies and trying to find a way to put an end through protests in any way we could to the war in Vietnam. Would you say that that is something that while, you know, you have continued to balance, I mean, you talk about, you know, getting the, uh, getting NCOPES, the, the black political scientists to, to sign on to a, a, a boycott divestment stra uh, attitude. Yes, with the Palestinians. And, uh, yeah. and you and your wife, of course, you know, between trips to Cuba, um, the admiration of and study of uh, of Chinese revolution, particularly Mao. I yeah. mean, how important is it for, for for folk now to really link the struggles of oppressed peoples here in the United States to, to oppressed peoples globally? Would you say it's still something that's... Yes, at first with Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. is still the key to Black liberation. It is very unlikely that you can have one without the other. The liberation of African people means the liberation of African people. We are in some ways the most advantaged African peoples in the world mm -hmm. because we live in this, this country, the wealthiest, the most powerful country in the world. So we always should be thinking about how we can use our influence in this country to shape or try to shape or influence United States foreign policy. And so that was... That, that became my kind of load star as a result of Vietnam, but it has continued throughout, as you mentioned, with the, with the struggle of the Palestinian people for their liberation. And I would like to see, do as much as I can as I could to advance their, the cause of those people as well. 
Of course, he did the same thing with respect to Southern Africa. So, so did you? Would you say? And it's interesting because in 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 reading through your intellectual journey and then knowing you and having you heard you speak so many times and talk about this, you know, you all were confronting um, an academic apparatus that not only wasn't interested in that kind of work, but particularly in, in the field that you decided to apprentice in, uh, political science. They were moving toward a type of uniform theory of politics. You may yeah. be cracking up thinking about all these books they wrote that nobody's right. reading anymore because they couldn't bring it off. But I mean, somehow though, you figured out a way to balance even into your intellectual work hard data-driven research with this set of commitments to liberation. Could you help us understand any even what roles do places like Howard play as you eventually come and join the faculty of Howard? Well, Howard is Howard and Ron Walters were actually indispensable in that. Mm -hmm. But at Berkeley, I I didn't I didn't pay much attention to political sciences they offered it. I took the required courses in methodology and sure. took a course in Marxism from one of these faculty. But I took black studies courses. I took three black studies courses. And then I took a number of courses in the experimental college, not the regular political science program, but the experimental program, which was taught by radical graduate students. I had a chance to take a course from William Mandel. William Mandel was a yes. William Mandel was an old line classic radical of the, of the 50s and 60s. He he was called before the House on American Activities Committee and accused of being a communist. And he would and so I had a chance to take the course from Mandel on Soviet Marxism. So I kind of avoided the the traditional Berkeley political science systems theory, that kind of stuff, and took courses in black studies and took courses in the experimental college from people like uh Mandel, young graduate student of uh, James Glass, who went on to teach at Maryland, taught a course on the psychology of liberation. The, the, oh, wow. The, not, not black liberation, the, the psychology of having a liberated mind. How do one liberate oneself from the constraints of bourgeois society? So we read people, we read the Freudian left in terms of uh, R.D. Lane and pe people like that who talked about the oppressive effects of bourgeois society on the sec on the mind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I, I I was at Berkeley, but not of Berkeley. In <laughs> fact, I got to know Aaron Rodowski, who was a leading scholar then, only after I returned to California teach at San Francisco State. We became rather close, but I ignored him when I was there, and Nelson Posby, all the other big names at Berkeley. I didn't pay any attention to that. I had these alternatives, black studies in the experimental college. So, so you then are able to navigate then that 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 though that those straits by anchoring yourselves in black yourself in black studies, and then you end up coming east to the new school. Now, new school. yeah, when you come to the new school, I mean, what's the purpose there? I mean, you you well, you, that's <laughs> that's a Howard University story, really. Yes, because at UCLA, I did the master's, and my major advisor, who I also dedicated the book to, was Harry Scoble. Yes. Harry Scoble was the only scholar that used political scientists at UCLA interested in black politics. He taught a course, and I was his teaching assistant. And when I finished my uh, uh, master's work at UCLA, he said, he told me, Scoble told me, that if you're really interested in black politics, there's nothing for you at UCLA. And he said, there's this young fellow, Ron Walters, trying to put together a PhD program at Howard. And he suggested that I go to Howard to study with Walters if I was really wanting to do serious study of black politics, because there was really no other place in the country to do it. And so I had been reading Walters' writings in Black Scholar mm -hmm. in Black World, particularly in Black World. And so I was familiar with Walters' writings. And so with Scoble's encouragement, when I finished the master's, I applied to Howard's PhD program, but Howard lost my application, oh, no. misplaced my application. Oh, no. so, I, so I said, wow, well, I begin I, I begin to understand Howard once I got there. But Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and, so, let, and let's be clear, <laughs> Haynes Walton, who you obviously wrote a book about, you know, you and Haynes Walton, 
if anybody wants to say, well, don't critique the black colleges, like Haynes Walton, you spent a great deal of time at HBCUs. You worked at Howard, the public. Yeah, that's you serious. worked Prairie at View. You Prairie View private. Yeah. Haynes Walton yeah. and all those years in Savannah State yeah. before going yeah. to Michigan. So no, anybody want to throw shade at Professor Smith, understand this is experience talking. So. Yeah, yes, yes. And <laughs> that, right, right. I taught at Howard, of course. Yes, sir. Well. Yes, sir. And Howard... Black HBCUs, back to this notion of knowledge as a base of power. Yes. That's a valuable, valuable resource that Black people have that's often unappreciated because that is a place where we can develop independent thinking and knowledge based on our own experience in a congenial environment where you don't have to deal with people who are hostile to the notion where at least everybody nominally is committed to this so that's it. Man, I want to make that point. We're going to stop. We're going to pause for a break in a couple of minutes. But I want to make sure people understand that, because even when you talk about Mac Jones, I mean, and you write about how the Ford Foundation gave Howard and Atlanta University money. And it, and these were the salad days when you could build a faculty like that. And yes. so that was that kind of the atmosphere when you worked there and when you came back there to work? Oh, yes, man. It was huh. it was beautiful. I mean, first there was. <laughs> Even the even the old line traditional black faculty at Howard, yes, begin that commitment to understanding in this new direction that the young faculty wanted to take, and so we had uh, we had students and faculty doing serious study from a variety of perspectives on black liberation, and. Let me go back, though, and just say how I went to the new school. Mm -hmm. Once I did not, once my application was lost at Howard, then I was caught and I had I had, no, I had nothing. And someone, I don't know how this came about, I mentioned this program in urban affairs and policy analysis at the new school. And my wife and I had just got married. There were tensions in Los Angeles between her family and my family because they objected to the marriage. I had old girlfriends that were coming around, hanging around. Oh, no. So <laughs> He had to get so, out of here. Out of here. Yeah, he said, let's just let's, let's get out of here. So if yeah. Howard was not available, then we said, let's try this thing in New York. And then we'll spend a year or so there that we can go on to Howard. So that's how I just spent I that year at the new school. Well, we, 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 we're we going to pause here, and when we come back for our final segment, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to work everything in. <laughs> as, uh, the majority of your years have you spent, of course, at the place W.B. Du Bois, and you both refer to as the most beautiful city in America, San Francisco, and you've been to San Francisco State. Yeah. Um, the longest chapter in the book, in fact, that, that penultimate piece on, on that period. So when we return in a moment, at the Black Table, we're going to continue our conversation with Professor Robert C. Smith uh, from the Bayou to the Bay, uh, really a roadmap, particularly for those of us who have dedicated our lives to try to figure and helping figure out the conditions of oppressed people and, and Black people in particular. Um, we're going to return to have him lead us through this, this final uh, leg of our conversation today at the Black Table, back in a moment. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I gotta defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay Black, I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig?
Welcome back to The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr, and we are joined today by Professor Robert C. Smith, author of From the Bayou to the Bay. Uh, Prof, this is incredibly unfair to ask of you, um, but after you leave the new school and uh, you are uh, recruited by John Howard, who you also dedicate the book to. Um, no, wait, did I get it right? Wait, no, no, no. You went you went to Howard from the new school. That's right. You went to finish grad school there, huh? I did uh, finish graduate work at Howard, PhD. Yes. Recruited by John Howard to come to the State University of New York at uh -huh. College of Churches. And John Howard is a black guy. Black guy. He was the dean of the social science faculty. And he went to Howard, and John Howard did, went to Howard in Atlanta looking for black people to recruit to the faculty. And so he then, he is, still John is still alive. Yes. He's my mentor. We still talk and write and converse. And as you mentioned, I edited, I co-edited the series for the Sunni Press with him. He was, uh, he brought me into the nature of the academic world, the kind of little chit chat conversations that you have, yeah. as well as the nature of the scholarship. Uh, he gave me the opportunity to co-edit a volume of the urban, on urban black politics with him, the opportunity to do this series with him. And even today we, we do work together on not only the series, but Mm -hmm. He's written a marvelous memoir of his family, John Howard has. Yes. And so we have been conversing about that recently. But he is, I dedicate the book to him because he was a major force in shaping my, my career. Well, let, let's talk about this because, again, you, you kind of have demurred, and this is as long as I've known you've been your way. Even as you've been prodigious and continue to work, you, you kind of deflect attention on yourself and kind of bring folk in. But I want to ask you in the context of a couple of things you raise in the book about your perspective on some contemporary events. Because as I said, you spent so many years at San Francisco State. You talk about Jesse Jackson being the most important political leader, black political leader of the post-civil rights movement. And um, your engagement in, in that work, even while while you were here in DC. And also you talk about Ron Walton being the most important scholar activist of the second half of the 20th century. You know, what lessons can we learn from from them and from you know today as it applies to and, and that and then of course folds your work in as well. Yeah, the uh, first Ron Walters. Ron Walters was an activist scholar. Hmm. That is, uh, if Ron had been a physician or a lawyer, he would have been an activist because he was an activist before he was a scholar. He, yes. He became a scholar as a means to carry on activism. And he began that, of course, when he was a young man back in his Wichita, Kansas, where he led the first modern city uh, movement. Yeah. And he continued it throughout his life. No, I used to take classes with him or have conversations with him. And I would get off into some little esoteric area. And Ron would always come back and say, Bob, what does this have to do with the liberation of black people? Now, now for everybody who, if you don't think that lesson took, this is one of the 19 books. <laughs> what has this got to do with the what liberation is of black people? It's one of your two books yeah, on Ron yeah, Walker. Right? Not, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Ron, he was very skeptical of Jesse Jackson. He thought Jesse, Jesse Jackson was flamboyant. It didn't particularly as, as were you. Yeah. Yeah. And Ron Ron was impressed with Jackson's role at the 1972 Black Political Convention. Hmm. Where Jackson was able to move easily and honestly between the various factions, the radical nationalists. And parenthetically, has, has there been as important or watershed a convening of differences of black political and cultural opinion as there has been, as there was in 72. Would you say no. that there's been anything like it since? No. And it's, unfortunately, it's very unlikely. Mm. Because the radical wing, uh, the radical, the system challenging forces in black politics have been marginalized uh, to such an extent. In, they have no in, voice. In, in your book, we have no leaders. Yeah. African Americans in the post civil rights. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we have black people, black leaders, black people mm -hmm. should be in the forefront of making a thorough critique of the American order 
and we're not. Uh, we become the part of the system rather than challenging the system. Yes. So, and is that is that is that some, uh, why is that? We've only got about three four minutes left. So, if you had to say, as a scholar who has not only studied this but been at the center of this work of trying to change it, w w why is that, Professor Smith? I, I I think I think if you don't have outside forces in the black community organized and mobilized in a system challenging way, then you get this. You get this cooptation really. Mm -hmm. And much of the leadership of Black America since, since the end of the 70s has been more interested in gaining entry into the system than in mobilizing and organizing their own community. And I think there probably is a kind of inevitability to that, the lure of the system in terms of status and mm -hmm. at least the symbols of power. So, so then... Okay. radicalizes us in a way that was not the case when we were outside the system fighting to get in. That gave an impetus for system challenging. But once a significant number of Blacks gained entry into the system, mm -hmm. then people began to say to young people, this is the way. There's no other way. Ah, so and, you are oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, as I said, I think there probably is an inevitability to it. Uh, That's what I was going to ask you. But it's, it's an unfortunate development because without a powerful force, and this is one of Ron Walters' teachings, without a powerful force outside of the system, then the black people inside the system will be relatively powerless. So, so it's interesting because as a scholar, you I think about your proposed work with Daniel CP studying the local chapters and couldn't they couldn't get it off the ground. Right. Your work with the Joint Center, where you want to look do drill down. You know, as we think about academics, people who want to do research and, and do it in the interest of Black people. You know, it, it seems like that it top down foundation paying elite thing is yeah. really has taken root, and so I wonder. And, and of course, you say nobody can know the answer. You, I think you quote Dylan said the answer is blowing in the wind. But <laughs> what, what, what do you see as not only the, the future of possibilities for political work uh, in this country for oppressed people, particularly black people? And, 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 and is there I mean, I forget who, who it was. Maybe the reviewers, one of your books said, you know, you end all these books on a pessimistic tone. <laughs> but then Martin Kilson called you a, a, a yeah. radical. Or something. I mean, but what do you see coming down the pike in, in the immediate future or long term, either for black people in this country or, or even black studies as an academic practice? Either one. Well, on the black studies, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I am ah. very pleased. Uh, I think. Good scholarship is coming out of Black studies, and it's it's it's, it's doing what what we need to do is unraveling the evolving nature of white supremacy, mm -hmm. and dealing with this power struggle between blacks and whites. I think if there's one thing I'm optimistic, and, I, and it wasn't necessarily the case that is Black studies could have gone the other way. It could have been co-opted as well. But I'm quite pleased with the direction that I see the young Black Studies scholars taking both informally, informal Black Studies departments and in doing work outside of Black Studies. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, I just finished a book on Trump. Trump is, represents the emergence of white nationalism, kind of conscious white nationalism, which Ronald Walters wrote so effectively, wrote early and effectively about this sense among white people of a white consciousness and white grievance, this sense among white, a large segment of whites, about 40% of the white population adhering to this white nationalist ideology, which says in effect that black people have already gone too far. They already have too much and we need to stop. I think we have that 
as a factor in American politics. And then we have a kind of increasing egalitarianism, racial egalitarianism in the Democratic Party. And these two forces, I think, are going to clash for the next generation. Hmm. Democratically, the outcome will be, if it is a democratic process, the outcome will be the more egalitarian forces will triumph through the normal workings of the American democratic process. Hmm. But it might be it might not be democratic. One thing, one thing yes, that Trump represents, in addition to white nationalism, is this authoritarianism, this anti-democratic impulse. I was gonna ask you, Prof, how worried are you about that, brother? I mean, I'm yeah, quite worried about it. Are you? Yes, because I think I think Trumpism represents a faction, a large faction among whites that will be unwilling to accept further movement toward an egalitarian, racially egalitarian society. And I think if they lose to the democratic process, I think what January 6th teaches us is that they will be prepared to use other means to maintain their power in the face of their becoming a shrinking minority so in the country as a whole. We, we 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 and we're out of time, but I, I really uh, I beg uh, to ask you. I got to ask you this final question because there's a lot of conversation, particularly among young folk and those who are on the, the far left. I would say, if we see left right, that engaging in the political process is a dead end, particularly electoral politics. What, mm. having lived through this period of seeing these kind of things, literally, what would you have to say to folk who might withdraw from the political process as we have? No, no, don't withdraw from the normal democratic processes and procedures. They're very important. They're important first to keep the to keep the white nationalists and the authoritarians from taking formal political power, but also understand and engage in system challenging politics. The Black Lives Matter movement has many difficulties and problems, but it has been an important force in helping to keep and hold accountable and push in a more egalitarian direction, not only mainstream black politicians, but also white politicians, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, influenced by the Black Lives Matter protests. So the lesson of black politics in this era is we're going to have blacks in Congress, blacks exercising power in the cabinet. That's good. Voting is good. Electing as many progressive Democrats is good. But also, we need to see if we can find a way, and this is one thing that scholarship can do, to begin to think how we can find a way in the present situation to rejuvenate this movement, this this grassroots movement, people organizing at the grassroots level. And I don't mean it necessarily just in in, in, in what are called the ghettos, but organizing at a grassroots level outside of the formal political process to continue to bring mass protests, mass demonstrations, occasional violence even, as a means to challenge the system to move in a racially egalitarian direction. That's still that's still the task before us, yeah. and you need both. Uh, so I would encourage, I would, uh, no one should abandon the political process, register, vote, try to get as many progressive thinking people into office as you can, Mm -hmm. and then do the other thing. Try to organize a grassroots movement of protest, challenge, even challenge to black leadership. Absolutely. Yes. That's where I, that's where I think kind of dual focus of the struggle should be. Absolutely. And, and, and everyone watching this, uh, these are words from a scholar activist of the first order himself. So when you think Ron Walters, when you think Haynes Walton or Mac Jones or Jewel Persage or Adolph yeah. Reed Senior or Junior, when you think of Alvin Thornton or Don Davis, yeah. any of these folk who have come along, you've got to mention the name of our brother, Robert C. Smith. Uh, please read not only his uh, intellectual autobiography from the Bayou to the Bay, read his works. Uh, nearly 20 books, over 100 published articles in academic journals, and his wide range of commentary, his his, his, his continuing intellectual work. Um, we we I, ho- I hope you'll uh, you'll join us again, Prof, because we we need your mind on everything. So <laughs> if we can prevail upon your time and love to your wife and family, you know, we'd love to have you back, man. <laughs> I, I really I really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and I appreciate you inviting me to participate. Always and. Struggle goes on.
always no question yes no question there's no sheltered rear (laughs) (laughs) yes sir okay well thanks very much of course of course good to see you brother all right all right right. back in a moment we're going to wrap and uh, clear the table and uh, when we come back in a second uh here at the black table Greg car black star network um back in a moment Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? In closing, I'm going to read a quote uh, in honor of Robert C. Smith, our guest today at the Black Table, from one of his comrades, uh, the great Mac Jones. Uh, Mac Jones uh, is a brother who, um, great political scientist, uh, one of the architects, along with Professor Smith and so many of his colleagues, along with Ron Walters and so many others, of the field of Black politics, the academic field of Black politics. Um, Mac Jones writes, perhaps the most compelling question facing social scientists, especially those being trained and inducted into the profession, is how do we come to know what we think we know? Today we heard from a brother who uh, is a passionate uh, struggler for the liberation of black folk, who has taken his intellectual work seriously enough to question all assumptions, because we know that if we base our actions on wrong thinking, we end up in wrong places. So we were very, very fortunate to have Professor Robert C. Smith here for the first time. It won't be the last. And uh, we look forward to our next session of The Black Tape. So join us next week. Looking forward to it.